Hey friends, it's Jara. Welcome back to my channel. So today is a long awaited part two <laughs> to a video that I posted, I think about three and a half years ago now. It's my testimony video and that video over the years has reached a lot of people. God is good. And I've received a lot of comments over the years and questions and things like that. And today I would love to address all of that um, as much as I can. I have written down a good amount of stuff that I need to try to address. Um, I also have some book recommendations for you guys, which I think could be very helpful. And we're just going to talk about all the things pretty much that I talked about in my testimony video questions that you guys have given me, like I said, and maybe some aspects and insights to my story that you guys have never heard before because I wasn't comfortable sharing it at that time. Um, first, I want to say thank you for all the love you guys have given me over the years from that video, your support and telling me your stories and your testimonies of what God has done for you and how we can relate to each other. That means so much to me. If you would have told me back then, how many people it would have reached, I never would have believed you. I was like, God, if this just speaks to one person. And at that time, when I first posted it, I think it literally had like 50 views, 70 views. I never would have imagined that at this point, I think it's like 670,000 views. <laughs> never would have guessed that in a million years. Um, so thank you guys for the love and the support, like I said. I want to kind of jump into this. I'm a little overwhelmed by how much information I have to give you guys, but if there's anything that I say that you want me to dive deeper into or other questions you might have, I can always make another video about a specific topic or answering more questions. So keep that in mind. Um, I hope this can speak to somebody today. We can have conversations, whatever it may be. So let's get into it. Um, I should probably pray first. Let's do a quick prayer. Um, Heavenly Father, thank you for everything you have done for us. Thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace. I pray that you will speak to some people today, that you will speak through me. Let me be used by you. Whatever insights I need to share or of my experiences I need to share, I pray you will guide me in that. Let us have open minds and open hearts to you and your wisdom and let us follow you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, let's jump into it, guys. This is kind of a heavy, I don't know if you just say topic, because it's a lot of topics. It's just a heavier video today. Um, also, let me just say, things I'm going to share in this are from my experience and what I've went through, things that have worked for me, all of that. You're on your own journey. Things might help me that don't help you. Things might help you that don't help me. We're all different, so just keep that in mind. Let's get into it. I don't know how long this video is going to be. The number one question I have received through all of these years is, how did you stop watching pornography? Firstly, let me say that I am four years I don't know if you say sober. I'm four years free from pornography addiction, um, which I'm so happy and proud to say. Um, if you haven't watched my first video, I would recommend doing that just to give you an insight to what all I'm going to be talking about today. I don't know how much sense all of this will make unless you watch that first video. Um, I also, I'm going to be able to be more vulnerable with you guys in this probably than I was in the first video because over these years, I've become more comfortable with being vulnerable and sharing more information and insights to stuff than I was then. Um, then I was just starting this journey of recovering from this and becoming free from it. So there was a lot of stuff I was still ashamed of or wasn't comfortable talking about yet. Then I didn't share as much information as I'm going to now, pretty much. Um... How did I stop my addiction? Because I was addicted for about seven years, I think, starting seven and a half years, something like that, starting at the age of 12 years old. First thing I'm going to say, the number one thing that is keeping you in pornography, I believe, at least from my <laughs> insights, um, as far as I can tell, that's the majority of people, 
is shame and keeping your sin in the darkness away from other people. Sin thrives in darkness. Things that you are struggling with, if you keep it hidden from people, that shame and that feeling of being dirty and like it's a big secret and like this is who you are and it's like makes you think it's your identity is what's going to keep you in this cycle for longer and for years and years and years. Because sin cannot survive in the light. Okay. And for me, admitting my issues and bringing it to the light was probably the first step of, of growing. Because all of those years when I kept this a secret and it was like, it felt like the heaviest burden I was carrying around. This is who I am. Like, I am so ashamed. I'm so messed up. I'm so dirty. I am hopeless. I am not like other girls. I am not deserving of God's love. He's angry at me. He's ashamed of me. I'm, there's no way for me to get help. That's how I felt for all of those years. And it's not the truth. First of all, if no one's told you that before, <laughs> That's not true. Those things that you say to yourself and degrade yourself over the, the sin that you are struggling with, that is not true. And that's not coming from God. None of that is true. That's something else I, need, I think I need to differentiate for you guys that I struggled with for a very long time. I, you are not your sin, okay? I also think I struggled with it so long, like I just said, because I thought that's who I was. I thought like, I'm so messed up. I've been struggling with this for years. And every time I try to get better, I can't. And I'm so dependent on this. There's something wrong with me. And when you get to that point, you are saying, this addiction is who I am. It's my identity. And when you think something is your identity, I guarantee you, you will never be able to leave it. Because you have just convinced yourself that it's like, I can't do anything about it because it's who I am. So I'm just gonna live in this and struggle in it and feel guilty about it and have shame and not have a relationship with Christ because of this. And I'm telling you, you are not your sin. We are all fallen creatures. Um, I might pop up some Bible references here and there throughout the video. I don't have any specifics written down, I don't think. But as I edit this video, I will add some for you. Um, we are all fallen. But... Jesus died for us so that we can live in our salvation and the freedom of that and his forgiveness away from our sin. And just because you have temptations, you have struggles, you have sin that you've lived in does not mean that is who you are or that you cannot live a life without it. I think also the shame, the addiction and shame depression cycle really keeps you locked in. I think one of these books is a good reference for that. I'm gonna recommend this book, which kind of talks about our behaviors and like things that connect to sexual brokenness. This is Unwanted by Jay Stringer. How sexual brokenness reveals our way to healing. This is a very good book. I think a lot of these authors and things I'm going to recommend to you guys is going to go in depth a lot better with explaining these cycles and things like that. But what I will say at first is you have to recognize that you are dependent on this. If this is something you've been struggling with for years, you've become very dependent on it. Oh, I'm depressed. I'm sad. I'm gonna go to this because it gives me temporary relief or temporary pleasure. I'm lonely, I don't have any boyfriend, girlfriend, I'm, I'm sad, I'm whatever these feelings are, I'm angry, I'm depressed. You are leaning on this over and over and over again. And I believe this book addresses some of that. And you need to have some grace on yourself. If your addiction started at a young age like me, um, there's a lot of research that can be shown about how that has affected our brain development and the pathways in our brains and how we respond to stress and things like that. Um, it's all very scientific and like shows you, oh, I'm not crazy. Like this is literally shown that this is how it affects us. You need to be gentle with yourself and be realistic about it. If this is how you've lived your life for years, like for example, I 
struggled with this since I was 12 years old. At 12 years old, in these younger years, when sadly the pornography rate is going younger and younger and younger as generations go on of when they're being exposed to pornography. These, these years of being children, our brain is so formative at that, uh, those years. We're developing, things are changing, we're learning how to react to different situations and stuff like that. Being shown pornography at that young of an age and then becoming addicted to it really affects us a lot in a lot of different ways, emotionally, physically, spiritually, obviously. Um, so I wanted to give you guys kind of a visualization. I, this might sound like I'm kind of rambling, but all of these are kind of the answer to what the question was of like, how do you stop? I think it's recognizing all these different things is what made a big difference for me. So recognizing I can't, I'm sorry, I'm kind of backtracking, but recognizing you can't keep this in the darkness any longer. And I'm going to kind of come back to that in a minute. Also recognizing this, my sin is not me. I am not my sin. And then we're, now we're going to talk about a little bit about the pathways in our brain. So I think I heard this kind of, I don't know if you call it an analogy or what, but on like a podcast, I believe, where they're saying, like, let's imagine our mind is a forest and you started making a path through this forest at a very young age, right? Because all of our thought processes, how we react to things, all of these things we learn when we're younger are pathways in our brain. So if you start making a pathway in this very heavy forest, you have to start chopping down all these trees to make it through. So you spend years and years and years chopping through these trees till you've made a path. And then that's the path you're gonna walk, obviously. You have, the rest of it is forest. There's no easier way around it, right? You're always going to go down the path that's already there. Even if when you're walking down that path, it's harmful to you. You're tired of this path. Every time I go down this path, I get hurt. I'm experiencing such pain and suffering through this pathway, but this is the pathway I have, right? So naturally, that's the way I'm going to take. And that's how it is with our brains. We create pathways of the way we think about things, the way we react to things, how we cope with feelings. Oh, I'm, like I just said, like I'm depressed, I'm anxious. I'm always gonna go to watch pornography because I've been addicted to this for seven years. That's my body's reaction. That's the easiest way for my brain to process my emotions and to, to receive a little bit of peace, a little bit of relief, pleasure, whatever it is. And then the shame and depression cycle starts again. So, with that said, in your forest, you've been making this pathway, right? You realize, I don't want to go down this path anymore. I'm tired of being so dependent on this. I'm exhausted from the shame. I'm exhausted from all of this. I need to start making a new pathway. So, you're going to start making your pathway. Guess what? It's going to take years of chopping down the trees again. It's going to take years of hard work of trying to make a new pathway. Guess what? Halfway through your pathway, your brain might be like, hey, it'd be a lot easier if we just went down that path. It's already made. It's easy. I can walk through it. But when you make the decision of, I'm not going to live my life like this anymore. I don't want to think like this anymore. I don't want it to be my natural response to always go down this path. So you keep going. It's hard. It's not easy. It takes time. You spent seven years. I've heard some people, they were addicted for 10 years, 10 plus years, 20 years, whatever it is, or maybe it's less time. If you spend years thinking a certain way and your brain has created those pathways, it's natural for your brain to want to go that way. I don't think it's a shameful thing for your brain to automatically think, let's go down this path because it's habits and habits are pathways. Okay. But where you show self-control is to be like, I don't want that path anymore. I'm creating a new path. And then be patient with yourself. Be gentle. No, this is not an overnight thing. You've been in years of, a, of this addiction. It's not an overnight. Now I'm perfect. Now I have no struggles. Now I've been free from pornography for years. It's not going to be like that. It's going to take a lot of time and effort. And that's okay. Okay? 
But also let me tell you, in this new pathway that you're creating is a healthy pathway. I'm gonna learn how to cope with my emotions. I'm gonna learn to not be dependent on this. I'm gonna address issues. I'm gonna better myself. I'm gonna have a relationship with Christ. Because guess what? Now your new pathway, you're not alone. Jesus is there walking with you. He is here with you for these new pathways, okay? He's gonna chop down those trees with you. He's gonna hold your hand and he's gonna help you through it and give you strength. That makes me a little emotional <laughs> to think of it like that. On the topic of being gentle with ourselves and the ways our brains work, um, it's not a realistic expectation for our brains to just never have intrusive thoughts or struggles or desires again. Um, I have been free from pornography for four years, but I still have intrusive thoughts sometimes. I don't really have desires to watch it anymore, but there there is a lot of things that I work on in therapy from the effects of it. And I think it's good to have a realistic approach with your recovery and moving forward. Of Don't shame yourself every time you have an intrusive thought. Don't beat yourself down of like, why am I thinking about this? Why whatever? But if you entertain it and you indulge in it, that's a different story. But it's going to be normal for your brain to try to bring up this because it was traumatic for you. Because it was during those formative years. And that's just sadly the reality of it. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't get better. I mean, years ago when I first started on this journey, I felt so tormented by my thoughts every single day, 24 seven, nonstop. And now four years later, not to say I never have an intrusive thought cause I do, but I'm able to live a happy life at peace, walking with God, learning more, having community, love my husband, my family, my friends, and your life can change for the better. I promise you. That's kind of my overview of how did you stop? These are kind of the big things, okay? And I'm going to dive a little bit deeper. You need to have community, okay? You need to have a safe place of support. That's like kind of your first step. Like I said, you need to bring it out of the darkness and be able to tell somebody, okay? I know that's your worst fear is for somebody to know. But if you are seriously, but if you are serious about wanting your life to change, you have to talk to somebody about this. If you can afford therapy, highly recommend therapy. I know it is very expensive. It's not always um, an accessible thing. Some type of therapy could be very, very helpful, okay? And being able to admit that and share that it's a therapist is going to come from a very non-judgmental place. You don't have to feel ashamed of it. If you need to work on yourself through therapy for a while before you tell anybody else about it, that's okay. If you have one best friend that you can tell about it, a pastor, a counselor, a sibling, a mom, a dad, a grandparent, somebody that is close in your life that you can be like, this is where I have been. And I can't do it alone. I can't fight this alone. And I just need to have it out of the darkness. Okay. If you don't have a community where you feel comfortable like that and you don't feel supported, you need to try to find one. Okay. Because when you find community of some sort or someone you can talk to like a therapist, you're going to be able to find some type of accountability. I think that's very important to note because there is so much freedom in exposing your struggles once I posted my testimony video and you don't have to do it so publicly but once I posted it I felt the biggest burden of chains lifted off of me because all of those years it was like I have the biggest secret and anyone finds out who I really am no one's gonna want to be my friend I'm never gonna find a husband I'm going to be shunned <laughs> pretty much. And so once I was like posting my video of what God did for me, I was able to, I've been able to have conversations with people, even casually in like small group or with a friend who's like, Hey, my boyfriend's struggling with this or 
whatever. I've been able to share my story, I don't know how many times. I've been able to talk to you guys, I don't know how many times about all of this. And I'm no longer ashamed of my struggles because guess what? Every single person has different sinful struggles. We all have temptations. We all have things that we struggle with that we're not proud of because we're sinful creatures naturally. We're in a fallen world, sadly. You have nothing to be ashamed of. God takes that shame from us. When you go to him and you ask for forgiveness and you start living your life a different way, there's no longer shame for you. There's nothing to feel guilty of. You need to pray that God would take those feelings from you because those are not feelings of God. I think another thing is that you need to label your sin. Like I said, you are not your sin, so you need to label your sin. I think all those years I'm like, like I said, it's just me and I'm just messed up. No, you're struggling with lust. You're struggling with fornication. You're struggling with all of these different things, addiction. And so we need to recognize that and be okay with saying that in order to get help. Because when you go to therapy or wherever you're going to go to get help, if you're beating around the bush, being vague, not actually just being like, I'm addicted to pornography. If you're beating around the bush, you can never get help. I was in therapy for years when I was younger and I did not bring up pornography until I was much older because I was so ashamed and afraid of it. And I could have been getting help all those years. Maybe I wouldn't have been addicted for so many years if I would have just been like, this is it. This is my reality. I need help. Please help me. Don't be afraid to label it. You have to. I think also change for me really happened once I had a relationship with Christ. This is not the case for everybody. I know there's probably a lot of people who have a relationship with Christ and they are Christians, but they still struggle and that's valid as well. For me, if you watch my video and there's another video, there's a testimony video and then there's recently a video I posted about how I was raised in the Pentecostal movement. And I did not talk about that at all in my first testimony video because I was very afraid of being vulnerable about it. Um, when I posted my testimony, it was shortly after leaving the movement and I wasn't ready to talk about it yet. Now I am so I can kind of explain the correlations to you guys a little bit more and maybe it'll make more sense. I remember people leaving comments and saying like, I don't get it. She didn't clarify like what really changed for her and where was her come to Jesus moment really. Cause I was vague about it. I wasn't ready to talk about it. But pretty much in January of 2020, I talked about this in my leaving Pentecostalism video. There was something that happened in my church where um, I felt like it wasn't handled correctly and there was an issue with authority type of thing and felt like I had been stabbed in the back and I felt like it was time for me to leave anyway. And I'm not gonna go into much depth on this cause I did talk about this in that video. But in correlation to this, January 2020 was also the month I stopped watching pornography. It's the last time I ever watched pornography. And I think that has to do with me pursuing a true relationship with Christ. Um, throughout all of my life, I didn't really have a relationship with Christ. I don't think that I would say I was a Jesus follower. Uh, it was all very on the surface. And because of that, I think I stayed in my addiction longer. I thought Jesus was angry at me. I thought he was disappointed at me. And so I couldn't go to him and ask him to transform me because I thought he wanted nothing to do with me. I'm sorry, that was like, I'm not gonna cry, but that made me emotional hearing myself saying that because I have not felt like that in four years now. And just thinking about the fact that that's how I thought of myself for all those years is very heartbreaking, especially since I was a child for a lot of that. I missed out on a true relationship with Christ for the majority of my life. I really think I've only been following Christ now for four years. And because I didn't have that relationship, like I said, I couldn't go to him. I was running away. And I wanted to do better, but I saw no way. 
no, no escape route. I saw no path of, of getting better. So you just feel hopeless and like, this is just how it is. So I would like ask you guys, what do you think of God? You know, how do you envision him? What's your relationship with him? Do you know him for who he is? And if you feel unclear on those answers, or if you feel like those answers are similar to what I just said of like, he's angry, he's disappointed at me, that is not who he is. And I would encourage you to study about Jesus, study about God, take time to know his character and who he is. If you take time to read the Bible, it's so clear. He's so loving. He welcomes you with open arms. He's here to help us and to transform us and take our heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. He wants that. He's not disappointed in you. He's not ashamed of you and he's not angry at you. He wants you to come to him so that you're no longer struggling. And I hear these comparisons of lot of like, you know, God is our father. And if you're a parent and you see your little child continuously doing something that's harmful to them, you try to teach them, hey, don't do this. You're going to get hurt. And I feel like God gives us that discernment when we are struggling. You know, we're like, we have that longing in our heart of like, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm tired. And he puts that in us of like, there's a better way. But we continue to do it over and over again. That's like seeing the child. The child continuously is hurting itself over and over and over again, just because it will not come to the parent. And if the, and if the child does come to the parent, guess what? We're not going to be like, I'm angry at you. I'm disappointed in you. We're going to be like, let me help you. Let me love you. Let me show you a better way to not hurt yourself and to live your life. And that's full of joy and happiness and peace, right? And that's how God sees us. We're his children. He sees a better way. He wants to help you. And there is forgiveness for all of this. If you feel so ashamed, you feel like you can't come to God. Read the Bible and see all the people of things that they did and they struggled with that God forgave. And that they he used them for amazing things. He can do that with you too. Let him mold you. This is just a part of your story. This isn't your entire story. Okay, so I feel like that's a good overview, I believe. Who knows? I am probably left things out looking back at this video. If there is, I might have to add in some things while I'm editing. <laughs> Let me get more into these books, okay? I did mention this one, Unwanted by Jay Stringer. I have two and then one more that I don't have with me physically that I read online. But this is a great book. This is Rethinking Sexuality, God's Design and Why It Matters by Julie Slattery. I love Julie Slattery. She has a podcast called Java with Julie, which I really recommend. She talks all about sexuality and different things like that. Um, I, should I read a little bit of this? In this in this book, Dr. Julie Slattery, renowned renowned expert on sexuality and biblical truth, equips you to understand how every sexual question is ultimately a spiritual one. Use sexuality not as a problem to solve, but as a territory to reclaim. See how sexuality is rooted in the broader context of God's heart for us. Grasp the bigger picture of sexual challenges and wholeness. And to shift the challenge from combating sexual problems to proclaiming and modeling sacred sexuality. Very good book. Okay. The other one I want to mention that I don't have with me. I read it online really good book. I think this might have been the first one of the first ones I ever read on my journey of recovery. It's called Sex, Jesus, and the Conversation the Church Forgot. It's by Mo Isom. I want to say from a girl's perspective, amazing. Um, guys can read it too, but just like hearing her story and struggles is so like validating of seeing it from another woman's perspective. It was really amazing and I highly recommend that book. It's been a few years since I've read it, but it was pretty much about her story and like God's redeeming grace and her testimony and it was very very powerful. The last one I'm going to talk about this one is called The Porn Phenomenon and this pretty much gives um statistics. This pretty much gives like diagrams and more of a I guess you would say like scientific view 
of pornography. Um, it says you'll find statistics on porn use and views about porn among key age and faith segments, an overview of research on porn effects on individuals, relationships, and communities, an insight from experts and ministry leaders on what the data means for culture and the church, and like charts, graphs, all that stuff. So this is going to give you more of like a statistical view, kind of like I was talking about earlier, of how our brains work, things like that, and how it affected us at young ages. So recommend this one as well. Also, there are communities that you can follow online. Let me pull up a couple of Instagrams. Hold on. Okay, so the first one is called Exodus Cry. Um, they pretty much show insights to ending trafficking and sexual exploitation, talks about the porn industry, all of that stuff. Um, this is, you're going to get a lot more like storylines and things like that about news of things happening, but I think it is good to have an insight of that. The other one is, look it up, is Fight the New Drug. It's a nonprofit um, organization that educates on the harms of porn. And I think seeing things like this, like in your feed is validating. Okay, it's like you're not having the stigma around it anymore. We're acknowledging it. We're going to, and he, they're going to give you different resources on these platforms as well. Okay, you're going to get to hear stories from other people and articles, videos, all that jazz. And I think it's very helpful to see that stuff. Um, I'm sure there's others as well. Those are just the two that just came to my mind. Now... There's something else I want to talk about before I finish up that might be controversial, but I did talk about this in my last, in my testimony video, and I've gotten a lot of comments through the years about it, and I want to address it. In my video, I specifically recommended um, the Relationship Goals series, I believe it was, by Mike Todd. Now, at the time, I really enjoyed Mike Todd's preaching his series, I looked up to him as a pastor, all that, those things. Um, and I felt like that series did really help me. But now, years later, I have seen changes from him and what he preaches. There's been many big red flags for me. And I would not recommend him as a resource for you. Um, this is my opinion. I've seen things that I believe is false teachings and I get comments about it all the time on that video. You recommend Mike Todd, have you seen this? Have you seen that? Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, I can't change that video because I posted it three and a half years ago, but I would like to address it now. I don't recommend him as a good resource. Um, not specifically just on pornography or relationships, but just in general, I don't recommend him. Um, so. Um, if I, there's any other resources that I am missing, I'm going to link stuff below for you guys, maybe some videos, or if I find anything else that I forgot to mention, I will I'm trying to make sure there's nothing else that I forgot. Okay, friends. Well, I believe that is everything I have for you. Um, like I said, if you have any other questions for me specifically that I maybe didn't touch on, um, please drop them below. I'd love to make other videos and give you other resources if I have them or if I have answers. Um, I appreciate you guys being so loving and supportive. Like I said, let's keep this video kind in the comments as well, please. And yeah, I appreciate you guys. I love you all. And I'll see you next time.